today and to really represent uh, the class of class two and, and the section of genetics. So I'm gonna start with a slide I usually don't present. Um, no, these are not tribbles from, from Star Trek. These are actually rabbits. This is how I got into genetics about 30 years ago. I grew up in north central Saskatchewan. I worked with my family. Uh, this is just a kind of a side project that I started with my mother to actually raise Angora rabbits um, for the purpose of actually wool. So we had to actually, I had a colonies of roughly a couple hundred of these as I grew up. Uh, and what I figured out pretty quickly is that my mother was a person that didn't prefer to, prefer to actually spin her own wool, but not actually to have it dyed. And so what, what I had to do is come up with a way to generate all these different colors of rabbits that would actually she could use to make beautiful sweaters. And at that time, I got interested in genetics. I was 13 years of age, and I decided at that point in my life that I was going to devote my life to this because of the power of genetics. So I realized that I could not only generate different colors of, of rabbits quite, quite, quite easily, but I also, when I realized that most of the mutations that you see here, such as the shape of the ears, you can see maybe some of these you can't see, but the growth of the teeth and so on, were all controlled by simple Mendelian genetic traits that could be modeled, even though we knew nothing about the microbiology. So those five or six genes converted a rabbit that looked something like this to this thing up here, and I realized that genetics was incredibly powerful. So I went to, uh, from here, I went to the University of Saskatchewan. Um, most people where I grew up didn't know what a geneticist was, but I was convinced I wanted to be one. Uh, I had the good fortune of working with a lot of evolutionary biologists at the University of Saskatchewan. I didn't care too much for, for actually uh, genetics. They thought it was too reductionist. So they taught me a lot about uh, uh, evolutionary theory. And in particular, I got interested in this question, which I call the King-Wilson paradox, which is this idea that chimps and humans are genetically so similar but in many ways, morphologically, in terms of a, a, a lifestyle, in terms of many aspects, we appear so differently. So from there, I had the great fortune of actually going to Baylor College of Medicine and meeting up with this man, David Nelson. I came to his lab in 1991 just as the triplet repeat paradigm. Some of you may know what this is. This was a, a, a mechanism for explaining genetic instability related to diseases such as uh, Fragile X syndrome, one of the most common forms of of X-linked mental retardation in the human population. And I was just in his lab when this was, come, was being identified and the papers were coming out. And David was a person that allowed me to explore a lot of different things. And in particular, I got interested in the genome project. I started to work on sequencing the human genome. And I decided that I would focus on kind of an inside-out strategy for human genetics, which was to look at the genome, study the genome, and identify regions that change very, very rapidly over short periods of time with one simple hypothesis. These regions that change almost too fast would contribute disproportionately both to disease and evolution. So I became fascinated with these sequences. They're called segmental duplications. And all they are is essentially blocks of sequence that exist multiple times in the genome, typically large, often including genes. They can be duplicated within a chromosome, in which case we refer to them as intrachromosomal, or they can be duplicated between non-homologous chromosomes, in which case we call them interchromosomal. The reason that these are so fascinating is not from my work, but from pillars such as these, Susuma Ono, H.J. Muller, Alfred Sturdivant, who recognized a long time ago that duplicated sequences are primary forces by which genomes evolve. So if you want to create a new gene, the easiest way to do that is to duplicate an old one, free it from its selective constraints such that mutations occur, and a new gene emerges. The other property of duplicated sequences is really their impact in terms of really mutating genome. By dint of the fact that you have duplicated sequences that are nearly perfect in terms of sequence identity, you can actually trick recombination machineries to essentially initiate recombination events where they, should, where they shouldn't occur, leading to copy number variation. So large-scale losses and gains of DNA as a result of duplications. And for those of you who want to know a little bit more, this kind of goes back to grade 12 biology, but all of us know that our mom and dad's chromosomes align during meiosis, and the reason our mom and dad's chromosomes know how to find themselves as we're producing gametes or sperm or egg, is by homology. So if you have, shown here in green, large blocks of sequence that are pr almost perfectly identical, what happens is recombination goes awry. So you have unequal crossing over events occurring such that now if you just follow these, these junctions through, you create gametes, sperm or egg, that have additional copies of that duplicated sequence or have lost copies of that duplicated sequence. So this one now has three versus one. The important point, which is really important for humans, is that if these duplicated sequences are not close together but are separated from each other, and so here I'm showing genes A, B, and C, genes A, B, and C get taken along for the ride. So now this gamete, sperm or egg, has additional copies of genes A, B, and C. This gamete has lost genes A, B, and C. 
And if you get anything from my talk, I hope you get this, is duplicated sequences can really mutate the genome at a really high rate, especially if you have this interspersed or non-tandem organization. So when I got involved in the Human Genome Project, this was probably one of the last things that was figured out. We got specifically interested in characterizing these duplicated sequences. And what I'm showing you, this complicated map is essentially your chromosomes, kind of car a cartoon of them, where the blue lines represent all of the intra-chromosomal duplications. So these are duplications that are near perfect identi identity that exist at multiple locations. Also, certain chromosomes, like our chromosome 7, chromosome 17, have been bombarded by recent duplications in very recent time in terms of evolution. And so back when we built this map in 2002, we realized that this was both really a kind of a roadmap, we thought, for both evolution of our species, so what types of genes have evolved within these duplicated sequences, but also a roadmap for studying disease. So any area that you see here with gold is an area that we predicted would be genetically unstable because it actually had these big duplications flanking this region, predisposing it to delete and duplicate. And since I had worked on fragile X syndrome with David Nelson, I realized that most patients, most children born with intellectual disability, autism spectrum disorder, and epilepsy had no diagnosis. I decided to target these regions specifically in children with the disease, looking for evidence of gains or losses of DNA in those areas of the genome because of the history of the instability of them. So I'm not going to go through all the details. We've now screened over 20,000 children with intellectual disability, but we have discovered new syndromes. So this is a deletion syndrome that our group, along with two others, described in 2006. These are children that have duplications that live right here in chromosome 17. We're currently deleting, resulting in a half the amount of copy that a normal child should have. And so these kids, you can see, they're all unrelated for one another, but they all have similar features. You see this kind of bulbous nose, you see the protruding tongue. These kids actually have a very positive disposition, although they're all handicapped. These are all sporadic mutations. Mom and dad are totally normal. They have two copies of this segment. These kids have one copy. Here's another region, chromosome 15, about a three million base pair region deleted sporadically in these kids. These kids have what has been described as autism spectrum disorder. They're very small, the 25th centile of growth. You can't really see it from these pictures, but you can see the characteristic facial features, such as the frontal bossing of the forehead, these almond-shaped eyes. And then here's another one, and these children don't actually have any characteristic facial features. They can either be inherited from a mildly affected parent or a de novo event, so it means it's sporadic in the germline of one of the parents. But what's interesting about these kids is that they tend to be relatively high functioning, but are particularly predisposed to seizures. So we think that 1% of generalized epilepsy in the human population is due to recurrent losses of this particular segment of chromosome 15 because of this historical duplication architecture. So one of the other things that kind of interested us is this uh, really possibility. So looking at this particular deletion up here, one could ask the question, you know, what is the benefit of actually having these types of duplication sequences in your genome? So one of the interesting things about this particular region I just want to bring up is that before we actually discovered the deletion associated with disease, a group had actually discovered already that this region of the genome is in, inverted. So the same procedure that can lead to essentially regions being lost can lead to regions being turned around. And so in about 20% of people of almost exclusively of European or Mediterranean descent, the order of the genes in this area is flipped around. So instead of being ABC, which is 90% of the human population, this orientation is CBA. So we've looked at this question of what is the relationship between the deletion and this inversion. And what we found is that pretty much every child who has a deletion of this region inherits or has the event occur on a chromosome that's turned around, inverted. And in fact, to make the matter more interesting, it turns out that that inversion, and data that's been published partly by our group, but partly by Stephenson's group, is also associated with increased fecundity, specifically in northern populations. So this is interesting because this suggests almost a yin-yang, that the actual presence of this duplication architecture can confer selective advantage, but also lead to essentially predisposition to disease. And particularly in Europeans, this particular orientation has created more complex duplications which derive, that res result in deletion. So almost all cases, about 95% of kids that have this deletion are of European or Mediterranean descent. So in disease summary, I talked about these large deletions, duplications. Our genome is particularly predisposed to these because of this historical duplication architecture. Uh, we think now that it explains about 
of intellectual disability in the human population, about 7 to 8 percent of autism. About 45 of those original 111 hotspots that we defined in 2002 are now associated with defined syndromes or recurrent deletions associated with disease. And this human duplication architecture both predisposes our species to disease and potentially confers selective advantage. So in the last bit of the talk, I want to talk about the evolutionary implications of these duplications. So a couple things you need to know. So what we've had the opportunity to look at this duplication architecture, not just in human. So we looked at chimps, gorillas, pretty much most primate genomes that have been sequenced. And what we found is that this accumulation of duplication has not occurred in a kind of a clock-like fashion, but has actually had bursts of activity. And the most noticeable one here is the number of millions of base pairs that have been added as a result of duplication. 42 million base pairs added to our genome at the common ancestor of both human, chimpanzee, and gorilla. So a very high rate of activity. The architecture of our chromosomes is spectacular. So this is just showing you kind of a view of one of our chromosomes, showing you the complexity of all the duplications at about 20 different locations across that, uh, that, that chromosome. So all of these different colors mean that the duplications have come from different places and have come together at these specific locations. What's really interesting is if you go and do the same experiment, resequence, let's say, a baboon or a macaque, chromosome 16, which is virtually identical, what you see is essentially all of these loci are essentially single copies in these species. So if this represents the ancestral state of humans, we went from this to this, adding 10 percent of our mass to chromosome 16 in the span of about 25 million years. And the really interesting thing, coming back to that point I brought up in the beginning, is that if you factor this in, in terms of the difference between the chimpanzee and human, we have another 4 percent difference, at least at the base pair level, as a result of this duplication business. So these duplications are not just sequences. They actually carry genes within them. And these genes are very different from most genes that you would see. Uh, these genes don't have counterparts in mammalian, other mammalian species. So you can't find copies of these genes, most of them, in a mouse, a rat, a dog, or a cat. So they're things that have evolved in the last 15, 20 million years of evolution. Many of these genes, the ones that we do know functions are, are involved in really in terms of growth, particular cellular growth some involved in drug detoxification, some involved in immune response. But what's interesting, and just to show you some examples, and I won't go into any detail, these are some of the gene innovations that have occurred in the human great ape ancestor. These are the gene names here, but I just show you the colors here to show you that different duplications have come together, creating essentially new genes from different parts of, of, of genes that have been brought together as a result of this process. So I'll leave you with essentially one short story. Uh, it's a recent one that we've been working on. We've also had the ability to identify genes that have duplicated specifically in humans since the emergence from chimpanzee and gorilla. And so this is one of them. There are about 31 such gene families. Uh, they are enriched for genes involved in neurodevelopmental processes. Uh, this gene in particular is very interesting. The gene, is, gene name is terrible, so I won't even mention it. Uh, we call it SIRGAT2. Uh, it has been shown to be involved in controlling migration of neurons, particularly early in development, and also in the formation of dendrites. And so dendrites go to form essentially sp spines which go to form synapses in, the, in, in, in uh, brains of, of mammals. Interestingly, humans are the only species, at least the only mammal that we've seen so far, that has additional copies of this duplicated gene. So in orangutan and chimpanzee, there's a single copy of this gene, and in humans, there are two additional copies which have occurred on chromosome one. I won't go into how we did this, but we were able to estimate the age of these duplications between about two to three million years ago. What's interesting though, and if you can kind of see it from this picture, is that the duplications, the daughter and the granddaughter copies, are essentially incomplete. So they don't have a complete structure, at least that would produce a protein, with respect to surgap 2A, which is the ancestor. So how does this gene work? So this isn't our work, but it's work of Frank Fulot. The gene works early in gestational six day week, uh, I think six weeks of development. It essentially controls migration of neuronal precursor cells from the ventricular zone to the cortical plate. And the way it does this, it acts as essentially almost like a, a, a break to essentially neurons that are migrating. So when the concentration of SIRGAP2 gets high, what it does is it interacts with itself through this protein domain called an FMR or dimer domain, and it induces filopodia, so these projections from cells, and they act almost as if breaks in terms of the neuron that's migrating. Uh, from the ventricular zone to the cortical plate. And so in beautiful experiments done by this group, they showed that when the concentration of SIRGAP2 gets higher, 
neurons don't migrate as far because they begin to form projections too early. If you reduce the concentration of SIRGAF2, you essentially allow neurons to migrate much, much further before they start to produce these projections that will go to form the synapses. So when you have a duplicate copy, when the duplicate copy is incomplete, it acts like a poison pill, at least in principle. So it has this F-bar domain, so it can interact with this protein. But what it does, doesn't have is these other protein domains which are necessary for these protrusions. So the presence of the duplicate copy essentially stifles or inhibits, a, similar to the a low SIRGAP2 concentration, allowing neurons to migrate further from the ventricular zone to the cortical plate. And experiments that I won't have time to go into, but I'll show you this one because I think it's just so clever. Here's one where you just simply, the, the uh, Frank, Frank's group has actually put SIRGAP2, the ancestral copy, into COS cells. And you can induce these philopodia, just like these little hairs that you're seeing. And here, he actually has, has introduced both SIRGAP2 plus the granddaughter human-specific gene, and he ablates this function. So it can't produce, presumably because of this interaction. And in additional experiments that he's done, he's shown that in both in mice and as well as cell lines, that either low expression of SIRGAP2 or essentially the expression of this granddaughter co copy, SIRGAP2C, both has this effect in terms of neuronal migration, but also has effect in terms of increasing spine density, changing the shape of the spines, as well as potentially the shape of the synapses themselves. So a really cool gene, a really cool duplicate. I think there's much more to the story that needs to be uh, worked out. I will tell you that we've begun to screen patients with developmental delay in intellectual disability. We found our first patients about a, a week ago or two weeks ago that are completely missing SIRGAP2C, and both of these patients that we've identified are essentially uh, microcephalic. So I'll leave you with this last picture. This is kind of a working model. Two to three million years ago, we had these duplications that created extra copies at different locations in chromosome one. And what's particularly interesting about this time point, two and a half, three million years ago, this is the time where essentially, according to, if you believe the fossil record, we were going from Australopithecines to essentially the species Homo. And one of the most remarkable things happened during this time, which is the expansion of the human brain from 350 cubic centimeters to about 1,000. I'm not going to say this gene is, is the gene responsible for that, but it may be important in helping neurons get to the right place, especially if you're increasing your volume, increasing your surface area. You gotta, neurons got to mi migrate much, much farther before they actually begin to form dendrites and synapses. So this is what I talked about, really three take-home messages. First, of, our genome is predisposed to copy number variation because of this duplication architecture, which is causing a high rate of gain and loss. And so part, but not all, of the reason that we have children with intellectual disability and autism is because of this recurrent gain and loss of sequences because of this, this uh, organization. There's been a burst of duplication activity in the common ancestor of human and great apes. This is very different than most other mutational processes that are very clock-like. And our working hypothesis is the disadvantage of these recent duplications, which is disease, is offset by the, really the birth of new genes that confer a selective advantage. So I won't go into all the names of the people. I've had the, really the blessing to work with about 100 people over the last uh, uh, 20 years, uh, uh, postdocs, students, uh, programmers, and they've been absolutely the key to success, I think, is having great people. I also want to acknowledge uh, these two people that unfortunately couldn't be here because of health reasons uh, that have been really a pivotal, pivotal in my life, um, encouraging me not only to be, uh, they never encouraged me to be a scientist, that encouraged me to be a free thinker, which was actually a pretty important part of uh, where I came from. And then lastly, these are the folks that are uh, my bedrock of support uh, back home in Seattle. Uh, they continue to uh, entertain me in my long absences and understand, I hopefully understand my passion for the science. Thanks. <laughs>